I'm always so very excited when I get the chance to have a seminar in, in English. Because then instead of saying fures or fures, I get to say force. Because that's what we call in English. Uh, so very warm welcome to all of you to force and to internet of no things. Uh, you know you're three times lucky today. First of all, because you were very quick in registering for this seminar, which we had to close within hours due to the huge interest. Um, and by the way, we always overbook by about 20% because we heard that that's what the airlines do. So if any of you would like to come to a later seminar, instead of this one, we'll give you free drinks and a voucher for a meal. <laughs> no volunteers will then, uh, then uh, stick around. Uh, second of all, you're lucky because we got an incredible panel, and I don't always say that. It's usually true, but I don't always say it. We've got Rupe Moka, who's here uh, uh, from Demos Helsinki. He's the founder of Demos Helsinki. He's a uh, self-proclaimed futurist, and he's one of the few that can actually live up to that description. we got um, uh, Isadora Vronsky. Uh, who is now changing your title at Greenpeace, but many of you, I think you all know Isadora from Greenpeace, and you all know how great it is to have her at a panel. We got John Monochiri, who is there, who is the founder of Future Perfect. It might be all right now, but it's going to be perfect in the future. We got Sara Johansson, who is the chair of Happy Sweden. Many of you might not have heard about Happy Sweden before, but I'm sure you will in the future. And then we got my dear colleague, uh, Richard Linde, who's there, who heads the uh, Digitala Samhället, the Digital Society here at Fores. And last but certainly not least, we got uh, James Hanusa, who's uh, I can't even describe all that you are, but you, you are the global advisor to, to Burning Man. You are one of the ones who started 350.org and so many other things that I hope you're going to describe for us when we go through this. Uh, oh, and the third reason you're lucky is that I've got a very sour throat, which means that um, I'm going to limit myself to this introduction and then some very few questions, and that also means that you will get ample opportunities for your questions. So just make sure that you give me a small sign and then this mic is going to be yours. After the first initial presentation by Rupert, what is Welcome to the Future? What is Internet of No, no Things? How many of you were at the Almedalen seminar when we did this the first time? Not many. I was there. I didn't understand anything. <laughs> so I'm just so glad that we do it a second time and hopefully I'll understand it at least a little bit. And the good thing is all of you that don't want to tell others that you don't understand anything either, you can, you can give me a secret wink. And then there's also, you know, we had the last rosé of the summer before starting. We're going to have the first red wine of autumn when we finish up, when we wrap up. And that's your opportunity to go up to Rupert, one of the others, and say, hey, Please do that again, but slowly. <laughs> so that's our opportunity to learn a little bit more. We're first going to give Rupe the floor, and then we're going to have two dif different distinguished panels, and then we're going to leave the floor to you guys. Rupe, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, thank you for all of you to come here. Uh, I'm going to give you kind of 10 minutes thought experiment stepping into the future. Not the immediate future, but the future in 10, 15 years' time. So I welcome you to open your minds and be part of this co-thinking session about the future. Uh, we call it Internet of No Things. Uh, it's about the moment when Internet ceases to exist. It becomes part uh, of our environment. Uh, and we think it's one of the biggest stories, if not the biggest story of our time when this transformative force of internet will grow into part of our everyday life and the material fabric uh, of our society. The first few words about who we are, we are the Nordic think tank. Uh, it means two things, uh, that we operate on Nordic wide level, so we have projects around uh, the Nordics, but also that we think there's something really special in the Nordic way of doing some things, and not just uh, the welfare state or, or, or the, uh, uh, the political institutions and the governance we discuss here, but something between people. Uh, the trust, the way we do here, the flat society, the way uh, we can create innovation, growth, well-being, all these things in a very particular way. It's not like Silicon Valley or China. It's, it's something quite spectacular. So what is Internet of No Things? 
to be able to explain, uh, I have to ask you a question. So when's the last, last time you looked at your mobile phone? Who's looking at the mobile phone right now? Can I have your hands up? Uh, okay, 10 seconds ago? Who, uh, one minute ago? Five minutes ago? Six minutes ago? So the global average of looking at your phone is every six minutes. So people will take out their mobile phone, have a look at it, see if like there's a red tab on f on Facebook, if there's any new mail, they'll go to Instagram, they'll go to Reddit, they'll have a look at uh, what's, what's new on, on Twitter, has someone commented something, then back to the pocket. Six minutes, the same starts, something Facebook, something Gmail. It's obviously crazy. I mean, we disrupt our thinking and go through these same things every six minutes, every six minutes. So Internet of Things, uh, Internet of No Things is the point where we don't do this anymore. Is, uh, our key assumption is that in 10 years' time, we will not look at our phones again. That's obviously a crazy... Uh, Hypothesis, it's always quite crazy to say that, but what if someone would have told you 10 years ago that you will look at your phone every six minutes and go like this? And there's nothing there, but still you go back. Why? Uh, there's a very, very strange uh, law that not many people have looked at. Law in terms of how technology develops. It's not more very much talked about, but it's very, very obvious when you start looking at it. Firstly, things used to be really kind of heavy and really big. This is the first uh, memory uh, coming to Finland in the 60s. Uh, that's five megabits. Five megabits is so little that I don't even know how little it is, but all I know is that like, typically a mobile phone would have 64,000 megabits. So quite smaller. You know, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But that's not the only thing. It also starts including more and more things. So all of this, this is like an ad of what kind of things you could like cool calls consumer electronics you could have in the 80s they're all in this you know all these things you'd be able to buy from Radio Shack are in this small small mobile phone right so it means that things are getting smaller but also they're getting cheaper and they are including more and more functionality so there's technology worth 1 million crowns easily uh, in any smartphone, if you look at how much they would have cost if you buy the gaming console, the Walkman, all the things that are in your mobile phone. So this is the law. I haven't got a name for it. But it means that the price and size of technology gets smaller, and technology includes more and more functionalities. So what the logical end point from that is that we're going from smartphones to smart environments. Things that are so small that people talk about smart dust. So it means that you have intelligence, the type of intelligence or smartness you have in mobile phones. You can like spray it on the walls, you can stick it up your bum, you can drink it, you can paint it, you can do whatever with it. It doesn't cost a thing. And so the world will look something uh, a bit like this. Uh, we're working uh, with these university laboratories that create in the energy independent sensors. Uh, and it means that you can basically use the environment around you, the physical environment around you, pretty much the same way that you can use a mobile phone. And of course, you're going to have more and more functionalities, more functionalities that you actually have in your mobile phone today. So, of course, you know, we're from Finland, so this, the pulp and paper industry will have some kind of role there as well. So, <laughs> uh, otherwise, who would fund it? It might sound a bit sci-fi, but this is, these are you know, actual technologies in development, in, uh, in laboratories. Uh, so internet will become first everything that is electronic or electric, everything that has electricity in it will have some kind of internet qualities. And then everything that is man-made and finally it will be so cheap that we can like, even you know, spray some internet on the woods, if we like to, so they can tell us that when is the just the right time to pick us this particular tree. So you don't have to like harvest uh, in a similar way, you can just see that, okay, this tree is ready and ripe to be harvested right now. And talking about the harvesting, uh, there's a few technologies that are really key to this, and the absolute must is energy harvesting. And this could be the next big revolution in energy, or the one after the next big revolution in industry. There's so many revolutions going on. But it essentially means that all objects, all machines, if you like, will be able to create their own energy. 
So this sense of revolution, smart city, smart home, Internet of Things, none of that will happen unless these sensors can create their own energy. It's absolutely key to understand that. And that's really what drives this new way of thinking about energy. So if your mobile phone or your laptop or your car or your home creates its own energy, it doesn't matter how much energy costs because it's in the price of the actual product. So energy uh, becomes from something that you create in massive farms into something you create from heat, light, movement and radio waves, which are the four things you can harvest energy from uh, and you can harvest them on individual level. Now this printable electronics uh, essentially means that you can print things that you now manufacture in other ways, sometimes cheaper, sometimes more, uh, uh, more expensive and of course at the core of this is the sensors. So now all of a sudden, we started having a lot of sensors in our mobile phones. Uh, and that's, you know, like this, this uh, movement, there's uh, velocity, there's uh, location, and all, all these types of things. And by adding these, th there's, there's going to be more and more ways for things uh, to be able to sense. So they actually tell who, how many people are in the room, what is their uh, body uh, saying, and, and, so, and all these things will be present to us in some way. So I made a small figure to explain all this very, very complicated thing. And this is it. This is what's going to happen. That's a sensor. And in the first stage it will get smaller and then it will be a bit smaller and then it will be so small that it eventually disappears, if you like. So some of you might be thinking this is a horrible world. That's absolutely true. It's, uh, it's, it's a horrible world. But also, some of you might be thinking it's a wonderful world. That's also very true. It might be a really wonderful world. However, the key is to understand that what's happening is that bits and atoms are joining. It doesn't mean that the internet would go everywhere and make everything internet. It also means the material world, the buildings, the, the cars, the food, the bodies will become part of the internet. They will guide how the internet will uh, start evolving. And as we can already see this happening, there's plenty of examples. Uh, Uber is one of the first companies that has been able to make this link between the physical world and the digital work, well, if you like. And uh, Airbnb is another one. And these just work with very basic sensor technologies. You know, you can take a photo and it tells you the location. Both sensors, very basic stuff. But, you, but it's, 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 it's just incredible how much value there is seen to be in this link between the material world and the digital world. Uh, and, uh, of course, the people who are thinking about this is a horrible world, they probably are thinking about something along the lines of this, you know, if all internet searches in Sweden are made with Google, fine, you know, they probably are, all actually, 99%, but who gives a fuck? I mean, seriously, I mean, it, it, as if, I mean, there are some people who are really into, you know, I uh, policy, uh, who might be in interested in that sort of things, but still most of the people think that, okay, that's okay, we use Google, it's kind of a good, we haven't got better ones, but if what about any kind of form of transportation would be operated by Uber? Or what if your home would actually be operated by Airbnb? Well, mine is, in a way, it's on the market, anyone can go and have a look, and they can book it, uh, if, if I'm not there. Uh, and in that sense, I'm already part of that game. So there's four things you need to understand. Internet of Things is already Internet of No Things is already happening. The joining of bits and atoms is already happening. It's something that's changed fundamentally our uh, our relationship to the physical world. If internet changed our uh, relationship to information, made information abundant, now it's the physical world. And this means that eventually internet uh, will disappear, it will become part of the environment, it will become such an uh, abundant uh, technology that it's, it's just like our clothes or buildings, we don't really think about them as technology, they are just something that is there all the time. So I'll come, I'm going to end with five nuggets, five kind of possibilities to throw uh, at our panel, which are possible avenues in which Internet of Things could take off. Uh, one of them is that we could enter a super resource efficient 
society. So all the natural resources would be optimized to the end. So no home would ever be empty. There's always would be someone there. You know, think about Airbnb on steroids type of thing. No car would ever ever be without, uh, if there is cars in the future, but without four uh, four people inside. Uh, so and you would never have any uh, anything left out. Everything would be optimized, recycled, uh, super optimized. Also, you can think about it as a post-choice society. So. For example, now I don't. I rarely make choices of how I'm going to move from point A to point B. I just type it into Google Maps, which will tell me that you will take this, or or if you don't make that, you will take the next one. So that type of thing that I don't need to make choices will become more and more every day in more and more streams. I will be offered something that will be the most suitable for me according to my. Uh, you know, bodily functions or, or, or algorithms about my previous behavior or something like that. There's probably also no need to own things uh, or owning things it can becomes kind of a speciality. You more want access whenever you need that or whenever you want that, on demand type of thing. And someone could say that that, of course, leads into a post market society because market is ultimately a information system. It tells you that this person liked the thing, he bought it, or he didn't buy it, or she. And uh, now we have much better information about how the behavior goes. We don't, perhaps market is gone. And one says we can think about entering a post-energy society in that sense that if everything that consumes energy produces its own energy, how do we have to think about energy at all? Is it in the price of the thing or price of the service? Uh, maybe at least the, the, the age of big uh, centralized systems that produce energy is, is gone when we go more and more towards the energy harvesting way. So where to now? Uh, there's two things, kind of two roads that we can take, uh, choose from. And you can choose freely. Uh, either you want the conservative agenda or the progressive agenda. Because a lot of the things, when I, I go more and more into this and try and more and more think about the future like this says to me, that uh, we should still try and conserve a lot of things that we have. Uh, but ultimately, that's a conservative agenda. We shouldn't be thinking about, okay, what can, we sa what can we safeguard from our current things? We should be more thinking about, like, what's the progressive agenda? What can I do with this new technology? What Can this technology actually solve some wicked problems of our age? Is, is there something used for this other than just having a funky technology around? And also, of course, for us, we think that this is where the Nordics can come in. This is where we can say that we have a society where there's a lot of trust. We have a society which is kind of born to be a sharing society. We share a lot of things. We have ideas of commons and so forth. So Nordic values is something where you can build this type of technology t on top of, as opposed to, let's say, the Korean or uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the American uh, way of doing that, which would be totally different. So this is why we think the Nordic, Nordic approach to this type of new uh, radical uh, innovations in the internet could be good. That's it, really. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's immediately put that to a vote, Rupert. Stay on. Yeah. Uh, um, I know this is still early days, and you only heard Rupert's early presentation, but for the two panels to know where we're at, if you get to vote between the conservative agenda and the progressive agenda, hands up who wants us to be conservative on this issue. <laughs> That's two. And uh, who wants us to be progressive? Who thinks that it's Nordic to be progressive? That's a 95% voter turnout. 5% didn't vote, but it's still a clear lead for the progressive. Well, that's good for the panels to know. Now, Rupa, if you had to single out one single issue that you would say, well, this is the biggest disruptive change that comes with Internet of No Things, what is that? Well, I think we're looking at three steps into the future. Now we have internet, which is abundant, it's everywhere, we have problems with data, private is, uh, privacy and mm. stuff like that. Next thing will be when your fridge will have some intelligence on that and it will speak to your, your electric cooker. And no one's really interested in what they will say. But <laughs> when we'll step to, the, uh, step to the point that every single object has got possibility to sense, you can communicate with that, you can build service la la layers on that, 
that's when Internet of No Things started starting to happen. So we got in a kind of like Internet of Things, which is I'm sure many people have heard of. It's kind of a phase in trying to get into that. It's kind of like what Internet was early 90s. Some hackers are interested in it, and maybe some kettle manufacturers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much, okay. Rupe. Let's bring up the first panel. We're going to have two panels. The first one is going to focus on, okay, so what is the second panel is going to focus on the integrity issues and the social issues. And on the first panel, um, we've got um, Isadora Vronsky, we've got John, and we've got Sara. Please come up to this stage, all three of you. You're going to go first, right? And he said, are you, he said, are you one of very few who actually had this, uh, when, when Rupert presented this at, at Almedal? And so you're one of very few who's actually had two months to think about this. So what do you, what do you come up with? Yes. Um, well, I mean, I, I completely, you know, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about this because, it, or I think this is, direct, this is the direction we're going in because when I listen to my peers, this is where the discussion is. So... Um, yeah, I think it will happen, and I think we need to. Um, <coughs> no. Hush to better. Yeah. That. Okay. Um, so I think it will happen, but I also think that we're we're in a, in a situation right now where even though global emissions stalled last year, um, and um, and it's not yet a trend, and things are looking a little bit m more positive when it comes to um, insta installation of capa uh, renewable capacity and um, um, also energy efficiency measures and so on. I think that um, there's always a difficulty when we put our trust into uh, technologies that are too far into the future instead of grabbing what is here, because what we need now is a really quick and fast um, trend development where it's decreasing de uh, emissions. So um, if uh, tables can uh, harvest solar energy or other energy, great. But we don't really have time to put all the investment budgets in that direction just yet. So, so that is one aspect. The other aspect is like, so I, I don't know exactly what it will take to do this, but I think that we need to have a holistic perspective when planning all kind of uh, development on the planet right now, because we're at this, we're at, we're at this situation where um, we need to think about the resource budgets, because otherwise there is no future on this planet. So uh, a lot of sensors or nanotechnology, what will it mean? What will it mean to our ecosystems? So, I mean, I brought this because it's a very physical thing. It's something that is super dependent on a lot of things. And um, it's just a reminder about where we need to be when we have all these exciting discussions about the future and, and what we should do with the future. Because unless we have this... If you don't see it in the back, it's a sort it's of an actual flower. Yeah, and it's not it's dying now because it doesn't have water. So that's ha just how sensitive those this systems <laughs> are. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so yes, sure, let's, let's be progressive with everything and see opportunities. And also let's just be aware that this is on the radar. This is going to happen. So, okay, m let's make sure we make it sustainable. But Isadora, your main reason for being enthusiastic is that because you see Internet of No Things as being the pathway to a very resource-efficient society? I think it's... Um, Th that I don't know. I mean, it could be, but it, I guess it depends on how you apply it. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't really... I, I think it's as everything. It depends on decision-making. What kind of structures, governance do you put in? You can use this for bad things. You can use it for, for good things. So it's. I think it's just up to us to use all the kind of technological development happening in, in society right now, not just on in this area, but others as well, and make sure that we have our long-term vision with the planet in place. We found a study saying that it's good for your health and for the ones on the panel to uh, applaud. So let's do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Isadora. Now, John. So, um, uh, Matthias knows me through a, a conversation event project I started called Future Perfect, trying to have conversations like this. And we've had a very successful one in Pittsburgh earlier this year where Matthias was present. But my day job is working as an architect and urban designer. And my previous job prior to becoming an architect was working for the United Nations Environment Program. I wrote their policy on sustainable lifestyles. And my real 
struggle in my job is to bring together lifestyle and architecture to achieve greater physical sustainability. And through this kind of stuff, my job gets much easier and, uh, and much better paid, in fact. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give you a quick framework that polishes up some of Rupe's framing, bigger, bigger picture, in this way. Three things to know, two things to think about, and one example which I work on every day. Three things to know. Most people don't really know what the internet is, let alone how we get to an internet of no things. So just a quick primer on what the, what's going on. Internet is essentially people and information linking up. All right? That's what you need to know. People and information on either side of a cable in some way. Internet of things is when you bring objects and, and uh, particularly passive devices, devices you don't have on your person, into the mix. That's people, information, and objects. And internet of no things, conceptually, I would describe that as the internet of experiences where everything in its totality, particularly complex actions and contexts, comes into the mix. So experiences are what link up. That's basically the trajectory of internet complexity. People, information, things, and ultimately experiences. That's what the first thing to know. Second thing to know is that what's really going on technically in the internet is composed of three things. And if you remember these, this is the, this is the second thing to remember, if you can apply this information around you, ponder it, and later in, when I've given you more things to think about, you will have a lot of power to reshape the world. It's connectivity, things link up. It's devices, things that sense but also can control, two-way control and information gathering. And fundamentally, it's also information processing. And the third component is super important because the internet of no things, or the internet of experiences, as I would call it, is not primarily mediated by you being told what's happening in that building or at home or somewhere else in the world. It's machines talking to each other about your experiences and working stuff out without you even knowing. All right? So the internet is essentially that trajectory, people, information, things, experiences, but with these technologies, connectivity, processing power, and pervasive devices. Those are the first two things. Now, the third thing to know, and it's very simple, and it's this. I'm an environmentalist because of the hockey stick curve, the exponential change in resource consumption in the last 50 years or so, 100 years if you include the whole Industrial Revolution. I'm scared of that, and I've always been scared of that, and it motivates me more than anyone except these guys might know to work hard, in, uh, and I find a lot of inspiration in challenging that, but I'm also terrified of it. The one thing that makes me feel inspired about the world we live in now is the exponential increase in potential through the internet. That is the exponential that counterbalances the increase in damage to environment and consumption of resources. Those phenomena, internet of people information, things and experiences, mediated by connectivity, processing power and pervasive devices. There is an exponential increase in it. And the third thing to know, it's not going to stop. So you can give up on any fantasy ideas about fiddling around. This is coming faster than any phenomenon in history. So. Take a step back and then ponder these two things. Well, what's going to change basically through the internet of in the internet? I will call it the internet, but ultimately this richer internet of experiences is in two categories. Essentially systems, but two categories of systems. Infrastructure and institutions, right? And so Rupert, in his five things to, to, to ponder, talked about the post-market world, and that is the ultimate, one of the ultimate institutions, the market. Community is another one. They are radically being restructured by this superflow of information on levels that we have yet to really understand. When computers are talking to each other about mass data sets, when they are heuristically working out what they themselves should know, heuristic algorithms, we don't even know what they're looking for. That's an information realm that's very new. And that will refashion the market. But everything within that, it will refashion what it is to be a consumer. If you put your home on Airbnb, Right? Not renting. If you put your home on Airbnb, are you a producer or a consumer? Ask an economist and watch their head explode. Because we don't have the models for what's going on right now. Right? So institutionally, there'll be lots of change. And I'd love to work with Rupi and, and these guys on that kind of thing. But my real interest and my job is about the change in infrastructures, physical things. All right? And so infrastructure change might be how roads are designed or how cars are designed, physical things, at the, at the large scale, car systems, really, not individual cars. And so those are, those are the two things to think about. When you have a sense of what the internet is, right? and what this internet of things, experiences is, and how it works technically, and how it's changing, it is the good exponential curve. 
Think of it through those two lenses, institutions, what's happening with how we organize people, and then think of it, if you want to think a bit like me, like an engineer or a designer, what's happening with how we organize stuff, stuff at a large scale. And so those are the two things. The one thing I'll give you as an example, just to scratch the surface of the kinds of things I can get to do. We can talk about this later, this is, and then we'll kind of carry on. But I just want to share this with you. If people have Apple Watches, and they will, realistically in two years, pretty much everyone will have some kind of d device like that on them. The way we organize deliveries, vehicles, locks, payments, will all change. Think of it. If, if, if the delivery companies know where you are, they'll do a lot more delivering, right? Most deliveries happen because it's ridiculously difficult to coordinate the stuff and the people. Think of that in terms of design. How, fewer, how many fewer parking spaces at the home in the, in the, in, at the supermarket? How would you organize locks? How would you organize play spaces? That's my little shaving of an example that is right here and right now. I told you it was exponential. Just you wait. In two years' time, here, I'm going to bet you 60% of people in this room have a smartwatch sensing device on their wrist that is bursting with technology that we aren't yet thinking about. So that's my little input for now. So my one question is, so how come you voted for the conservative agenda? Uh, th but th that's a debate that I'm sort of kicking off with Rupert, is that the, f the idea that you can go beyond... So he gave the example of, hey, let's not have smartphones, let's have bits of paper. Right, well, that's not exactly an upshift in interface design, right? If you do this, if you're writing, right, it's what we did for a thousand years or so, that's really bad for your spine. Sitting at a computer going this is much better for your spine. So it, it, the interfaces we've got aren't all bad. And so when I say conservative, I just put my hand up for progressive, what I mean is... Don't don't throw out what we've got as interfaces and device structures and technology systems right now because you can't guarantee that what you come up with will be any better. And what tends to happen as a designer, I know this from experience, if you say, oh, let's start from a blank sheet of paper, you literally start with pizza. You start with things that you know, which are just old legacy technologies, right? So I'm a bit of a conservative in the sense that I want us to design new systems of engaging, to exploit this internet of, of experiences in... Uh, a, a mature way, not just trying to reinvent everything because you can guarantee we're just going to borrow old ideas. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, John Monaturi. <laughs> and sorry, I want some happy Sweden. How many here know about happy Sweden? Not many uh, enough. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, not, m not many enough, so you have to start by telling what is Happy Sweden. All right. Uh, it is a nonprofit organization dealing with the uh, freedom of action of small uh, individuals. I'm sorry, I think it's on. Yes? Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm on? Okay. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the freedom of action of small, individual, and uh, special interests, and especially with an interest in great Nordic institutions and the relationship between individual action and great institutions. So basically, we're coming from uh, sort of uh, uh, the, the culture of the, the general Swedish desire, and I think Finnish and Norwegian as well, of our cities to be a little bit more like Berlin. You know, why can't it be a little bit more like uh, uh, Brooklyn here? you know people taking initiative and you know that kind of culture uh, and the answer is because we have great well-functioning institutions taking care of us and so then the question is how do we provide for great uh, freedom of action without compromising uh, great uh, working institutions so that's what we're dealing with yeah and I, I have to say I'm, I'm with you I'm with you but you know you're not supposed to write you're supposed to think I think right with the right it's the yeah so Total er ergonomy. In ergonom what is the word in English? I think, er I think ergonomy. This is still a thing. Yeah, ergonomy. Okay, yeah. So, just so you know. Just wanted to put that out there. Um, <laughs> but, okay. So, um, my points, though. Um, so, what we're doing, though, is we're working with physical space, and we're coming from a planning perspective. And um, so, uh, of course, as a planner, we're always interested in the choices that we have uh, to make. And in that sense, to a large degree, that we're inherently conservative. 
both in, in uh, sort of uh, um, uh, fearing the idea of uh, the post-choice society, the post-voting society that you've also uh, uh, been, been talking about, where uh, 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 democracy is ruled by behavior rather than active choice. And as we know, behavior is uh, uh, something that doesn't necessarily uh, uh, sort of indicate what we desire for society, right? Uh, we're pretty much, I mean, we have an altruistic side, but there's also a desire to optimize uh, our own interests at all times. So uh, a democracy based on behavior seems terrifying from our perspective. So that's uh, one thing to think about, we think. And then also, uh, of course, uh, the data processing development is going a lot faster than the uh, efficiency increase in energy production. So at some point, we might end up in a society where we are carrying our own batteries, uh, uh, in a sense, or being our own batteries, uh, sort of fueling our own uh, 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 needs um, with, our, with our bodies and so forth. Um, uh, but we have a long ways to go. And uh, I haven't seen any projections, but I think it's pretty far ahead. So uh, then the question is, how do we uh, make that transition? from today to uh, a future where we can have energy abundance uh, or uh, complete energy efficiency, as I think is the main point here, uh, um, um, and, and that sort of a society. So um, as you all know, um, um, the, the uh, uh, renewable uh, sources of energy are requiring a whole lot more space than, uh, um, um, the, uh, than, than fossil fuel or... or um, uh, 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 what's the name? I was uh, nuclear power. Nuclear power. It's so old. I can't even think of the word. Who can remember these things? <laughs> okay. So as an example, so uh, the area required to produce the same uh, amount of power uh, from a uh, wind plant is ten thousand times as great as required uh, to produce that energy in a nuclear power plant. So that is that, it, that has huge implications on uh, our society and our physical space and, and uh, how we want to construct our cities. So that's one thing to think about. This is, as right now, this is an energy abundance alternative. The desire is to go for complete energy efficiency, but today we're going I, I mean, all our stats are pointing towards uh, using more and more energy so with this technology so um, um, how to how to make that transition pretty much so that's one and then of course the issue of, of integrity censored everywhere I mean uh, what does that mean and in certain social contexts we might feel entirely secure being completely monitored and and uh, Swedish society and uh, Finnish society and uh, Norwegian societies are a good example high social trust right um, and so f for example we have a long history of collecting data um, personal data and being very comfortable but with it being done centrally and processed centrally uh, this is not the case all over the world this requires trust and social contracts. So um, what are the implications for the other parts of the world? Now, we're sort of coming from a Nordic model perspective in Happy Sweden, as are you in Demos Helsinki. Um, but what do we do in a society where the social contract is defunct, pretty much? But this basically means that you concur with Rupert that this should ideally start here and that we could be by far the most progressive. I, I think so, absolutely. But also then, of course, having to be aware of the, the possible uh, difficult and dangerous implications for, for other parts uh, of the world and other types of social situations. And also, of course, let's not sort of over <sighs> have, have overconfidence in our social contracts. They're always fragile and need tons of work to be maintained. Thank you so much for those comments, Sarah. I know that we got comments, we're going to keep them for a little bit. We're going to Im invite James Hanusa and Richard Linde to give your comments. Please stay on, just move a little bit that way, and Richard and James can come here. And you get to share the best mic. Okay. Yeah. So, James, I'll give the microphone to you first to uh, hear your comments. So the first time when we did this in Amidalen, uh I was the first one to get the mic after Rupe had, had laid down the framework of this thought experiment. And I'd just been invited to that panel, I think, 
I don't know, 14 hours, like, yeah, <laughs> a short while earlier. Um, so I was trying to get prepared and I didn't, I didn't really get it. And I asked like three people on the, dem on, the, on the demos team, like, what are we talking about here, the Internet of Things? It sounds cool, but I'm not quite sure I get it. Um, and I got the mic first and I hadn't wrapped my head around it, so I just passed the mic because I didn't know what to say. Um, that has changed um, through friendships and partnerships that have started. Um, we met each other in Amidalan, and then Rupe invited me to Helsinki to uh, speak at an Urban Life conference that they produced during the Flow Festival. Um, I decided not to go back to San Francisco and rather to um, focus on myself to put myself through a human accelerator, to be the guinea pig, to be the demonstration project, uh, to do an artist in residency in the Nordics. Um, slipped a little Baltics in there and in and, and London as well. But um, what I think we, we also said, how, talk about the social angle of it. So I think it's important to maybe make it personal. Um, what the, the Internet of Things, what if, what if, it's, what if Internet is, is accessible anywhere? And that's coming. Um, Elon Musk is putting satellites in the air. Google is putting Zeppelins in the air. Uh, we're going to have internet everywhere very soon at high speeds. That's going to happen. Um, so what if we've got the universe of everything? And we always talk about the physical environment, right? The cars, the buildings, your refrigerator. But what about the individuals within that situation? Uh, we talk about clothes. We, but what if you are connected all the time, completely, and you can create your own reality. There's a Swedish philosopher who's awesome called Alexander Bard. Um, he gave a presentation uh, in February in, in Amsterdam for us at the uh, Burning Man European Leadership Summit. And he basically said that that place, Burning Man, is a, is a physical representation of the internet. And I think what he meant was in that physical world, People are co-creating the environment and reality that they choose to live in. And we've got that technology now today with the internet. It, it will become more and more, I think, as we get into this internet of things world. And it becomes, again, more of a personal projection and interaction. Um, what if our, what we're wearing or not wearing or don't have in our hands or whatever is informing each other uh, on a, on a real-time basis? So that's, that's kind of where it started. Um, I'm really interested in where it goes. Um, so the two-month residency, uh, I figured out that I wanted to launch this artist. And for this artist to be co-created, and for this artist to be a guinea pig of possibility, and take that lesson learned and apply it to cities around the world and take it from an individual to a place and work with you know, some of the brightest minds and technical universities to create that experience and art form of transformation. Um, so we, we'll see what happens. So we're in the early process, but at least uh, the city of Helsinki has said that they want to be part of this. So we've got one city that's interested, um, and we'll see where it goes from there. But you know, from the Internet of Things perspective, too, what, what has happened in the two months is have been collecting partners uh, like Demos, like um, Alto University, um, to look at I'll mention some more. So uh, Windfire is a vertical turbine and induction charging unit for, for cars combined with, you know, messaging platform. Um, Unity is a new self-delivering uh, city electric vehicle that can be combined. So if you go to a city, you leave behind some of these possibilities in a district where people can go experience an immersive future of what it's like. Um, that, I think, is something called transformation which I'm very much a proponent of. So I'm a proponent of invitation and transformation. Uh, the power of invitation, you can pretty much invite anybody into, and, and Rupe explained to me kind of what I do and how I see the world. It's that invitation uh, to co-create. And what, what can we do together? Here's, here's a possibility for the future. What's your part in it? Um, transformation, you know, as a base definition, is never being able to see the world the same way again. So if you can create environments in cities um, where transformation is accelerated, um, what happens then? What happens when everyone's turned on to their creative possibility? And I think like the challenges that the world's facing today 
Um, it's not going to be a technology solve, even if we've got exp exponential technologies and efficiencies and all that type of thing. I truly believe that it's going to be people being turned on to their creative capacity and coming together with purpose to deal with the stuff that's, that's going to challenge, you know, humanity. Thank you so much, James. And last but not least, our program director here at Fugas, Ikar. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Um, I'm going to be a bit more practical and technical, uh, <laughs> which seems quite easy right now. Uh, well, uh, we've been thinking about integrity issues uh, connected to the Internet of Things and society today. And thinking about this seminar and this panel, uh, I realized that the Internet of Things might just save us uh, from some of uh, the bigger integrity abuses happening today. And the reason would be that the things that connect with each other, they need to be able to talk to each other without identifying themselves. If they don't, it's just uh, or I don't think it, it's going to work. It's going to be too many things, and they're not going to be able to log in to a Wi-Fi network, or um, they're not going to have a 4G um, subscription. There's just going to be uh, a million things in each home and in our bodies and stuff. So they're going to have to be able to connect, assuming uh, connectivity and assuming they don't have an identity. So they'll be really different from uh, the smartphones that we're sort of uh, uh, thinking about right now, which are definitely part of the Internet of Things. Um, and the smartphones are sort of uh, the one big reason why they're so successful is because they I identify us. And that's, that was sort of the first, uh, one of the first big issues of the Internet when we used our PCs and laptops. We, uh, you know, we all have a uh, hundred or a thousand passwords, and we have problems sort of coordinating that. And these things, they solve that, uh, or at least take us uh, quite a bit toward a solution. And I, and I would say that the Internet of Things will sort of bring us back, uh, but hopefully in a more productive manner. Um, so that's one part. It's a better, uh, hopeful part. Uh, and the other side of that is sort of uh, if uh, these things, uh, 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 to make this work, they, uh, uh, the things need to be able to assume connectivity. So we can't depend on, like I said, the Wi-Fi network or the 4G network or a mesh network. They just need to be able to connect and send their message to wherever it goes. And that, that brings us to uh, another world where uh, we probably have to talk, think about connectivity not in the sense of a market with operators, but more as in uh, uh, sidewalks or, uh, or uh, roads that we build and then anyone can use them for whatever purpose. And the more I sort of think about this, the more that kind of market makes sense and the less uh, the one we have now uh, does. Um, but it's a bit hard to sort of get away from the, the, the way we think right now. But I'm pretty sure we're, we're going to sort of struggle with this. And once connectivity is just something that is, uh, I would say that will be a major part of making the Internet of Things or No Things uh, a reality. But before it does, I, I don't think uh, we'll see that happen. So for, from a policy perspective, um, it's a pretty simple equation, what we need to handle, or at least one component. So I'll st stop there. Well, thank, thank you so much, Rikard. <laughs> and I know that several of you are bursting to give comments, but, and I'd love for you to do that in just a second, but let's have Rupert back up and uh, ask him to reflect on the comments that you've done. Because you've, you've got a fairly positive panel here, but you've been challenged on integrity. Mm -hmm. You've been challenged on maybe this is a way to postpone emissions reductions that we yeah. need to do yeah. now. And maybe before there's uh, solar power in this, in this thing, it's just going to be a huge increase in electricity consumption. For instance, those are some of the challenges that you yeah. heard. I agree. 
<laughs> no, uh, that's the easy one. I think I'll take um, th th uh, three things uh, in consideration. One is the the energy equation here, and of course, what we're seeing is that the, to be able to optimize the use of everything brings a lot of more efficiency. And we know from history, albeit it's not quite clear how it happens, that there's this thing called the rebound effect. So it means the more efficiently you do something, you do more of it, right? So there's nothing that really guarantees that we get that the super optimization will actually be super optimization just by itself. So the technology doesn't really guarantee. It just gives you a right to do that, but then maybe you use the energy for something else. I don't know. Uh, the second point, which was about the post-voting uh, or, you know, kind of post being making decisions, voting and stuff like that. I mean, if you start thinking about the world in terms of you will have abundance of data about what actually happens, you know, about people's behavior. I can see a lot of things that we discuss now on poli policy level on politics becomes irrelevant because we think about, we, we talk about what if this and this tax would come and we kind of speculate around it. But what if we try and then we have data and we'd see that what happened and we can see, see that, okay, maybe we do something different that didn't work. So I'm not saying that politics would have would disappear but there's a certain class of politics this that is just like hypothesizing about future systemic changes that really we cannot guess we have to try and see what happened uh, third thing mm, I don't remember what it was. Wonderful, because <laughs> we know that many of you are bursting with your questions but first a brief comment from John and one from Mr. Doga. Um, I was going to say two very quick things, but I just want to correct one of Rupe's points because um, the rebound effect is not about energy consumption, it's about monetary expenditure. If you save money through efficiency there, oh, you time spend as well. your it's money. Time as well. But energy efficiency hasn't yet shown energy rebound, and what we can say from that is that energy efficiency is good wherever you find it. And sensor wise, it will be very profound to save and produce energy where we can. So this is a little more optimism right. there. Institutionally, I think. The privacy issue is, is an interesting one. The institution around privacy basically is going to get reinvented, and we have to deal with that f from first principles. Most people don't know about Bitcoin, for example, that Bitcoin, this super secret thing for criminals, all transactions are transparent. Every single movement of money from one Bitcoin account to the other is, from the beginning of time, transparent. We just don't know who did it. Right? So, and that's something that people don't know, that, and it's hard to even to get your head around. What is anonymity? if people know what you're doing but they don't know who did it. And that's the new privacy regime. And that's what technology makes available to us and in some ways enforces. And I think that when we get to uh, the question of infrastructure and, 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 and regulation and investment, I could not agree more with the idea that once something becomes so omni-required, omni-necessary as connectivity, we start treating it like roads. We make sure they're there. We include it in the taxation system. We get what technically we would call rent-seeking companies. They're basically looking to make free profits forever. It's not a conventional market for bandwidth or for roads or for railways. Forget the people who say markets can work everywhere. They do not work there. Make it a regulated industry, tax it, and give it to everyone in vast quantities. Wonderful. Thank you. Isadora? Yeah, so <coughs> one thing that is really great about all those disruptive technologies just coming and taking over our lives, <laughs> uh, like solar power or internet or those kind of things, is that it makes us uh, think about things. It, it brings out the existential questions because there's a lot of complex things that we need to think about, like integrity and other things. And that is also sort of our also another part of our hope, because it's unless you see something uh, as a problem, you won't try to solve it. And in the sort of the green or the ecological movement, one of the problems have been sort of that you do, we don't react or we don't have the crisis consciousness, or we do, but we don't do it fast enough. And it's not until it comes to this, this moment of really transformative change, as you said, that, that you, can, you can get a quick fix of transformative change as Burning Man, but you can also get it in lots of other ways that you really sort of become part of this new system and this new way of doing things. So I think it's, yeah, another aspect of it. Last comment of the panel from Rikard. Uh, yeah, um, I think the, the, an important part to think about uh, of how we treat this is to remember that the internet is sort of a, a distribution media and the best way to use it or to build it is to make 
to make the, the distribution of information as simple as possible and put all the intelligence at the endpoints. So you have the intelligence here and at the servers. And we don't really want security or identity or anything else in between. We don't want the phone operators to handle our identity. Those solutions are always, um, they always end up sort of screwing up our lives in different ways. And right now I'd say we have a lot of those solutions that we need to deal with. Thank you. Now this, uh, this seminar is on Fuga's YouTube website for all those people who couldn't join us today because it was full and for all of us that need to see it again to perhaps understand a bit more of what you're saying. And that's the reason why you have to wait for the microphone for your question. This is now going to be the public microphone. So you were the first to raise your hand. Here you go. Yeah, thank you. My name is Maurice Jenkins. I'm working with uh, wind power at, at sea, floating wind power. Um, it is really mind-blowing what I've heard. And when I was listening to James, I couldn't help thinking of inception. If we are co-creating uh, together, uh, really fascinating. Um, and uh, what I'm not really worrying about is the energy uh, part. So I was, um, I forgot your name, but happy Sweden. Ha yes, happy Sweden, yeah. I think energy is the, the least worry, perhaps, because there is energy abundance. Um, if you just take the North Sea, for example, it will have enough potential to power whole Europe with electricity. It's not there yet, but the potential is huge. Um, but I do agree with Is Isadora at you know, how we're going to use the technology, uh, either for the good or for the bad. That's probably the main question. Thank you. And Sarah is the first one to go on. No, I, I just wanted to respond to uh, your uh, comment on energy abundancy, which I agree uh, uh, entirely. Uh, but the question is, uh, where do we want to produce our energy? And uh, one of the sort of core issues today when talking about IoT, uh, especially in planning, is uh, the smart city concept, uh, where you have local production of energy and a grid interconnected uh, uh, an infrastructure that is overdimensioned to deal with the highs and the lows, and so forth. And so the question is, where do we want to produce it? Wh what, what space do we want to occupy? Do we want to use our seas for energy production? And how are we, go wh how are we going to transfer uh, and create the infrastructure to bring that energy uh, to the consumers? So there are, a lot of, uh, there are definitely a lot of uh, questions uh, to be answered around. Yes, well, I'm usually in the energy sphere, discussing the energy issues, and I would say that there's no problem at all when it comes to going over to 100% renewable, sustainable energy system. There's some challenges along the way, but to be honest, it's not an issue. And we, ha as you said, we have enough resources that for to do that. So that's not a problem. But th if we talk about it in the context of the Internet of No Things, I think it becomes a different thing. Um, but also, like for instance, when it comes to energy efficiency savings, which is one of the big parts of solving this new puzzle, uh, this new energy paradigm. Um, I mean, we have to work with things that are already there, like building blocks and infrastructure and things like that. So ha the interaction there, I think, can be very interesting. Like, how can we, can we act by using sort of the forward movement of this technology, maybe the non-existing incentives for energy efficiency that is there at the moment can maybe they can jump on the new technology train instead because people want to do something with their house for a different reason than just saving energy because um, s saving money from it is not an incentive enough so there needs to be some kind of incentive so to get all these energy efficiency things to happen and then maybe yeah all right john go ahead just, to just put these, some of these pieces together in a way that might be helpful you said you work for fortum right Sorry. you work for fortum energy no. Oh. Hexagon. Well, an energy company. I mean, it, if energy companies want to f stumble their way into this, one of the things they could do would be to enable households and property developers and municipalities to calculate where you can actually can produce energy effectively, where you can save energy effectively, not just abstractly, but because that helps them design a better grid. Because the way in which energy companies will probably find their way into energy efficiency is not by fumbling around with consumers, which they've been pretending to do for 15 years. It's by saying, hang on a second, the next round of investment, if we get the grid better, so we don't have outages and peaks and we don't have to stumble around trying to optimize it 
with an overdimensioned or otherwise suboptimized system. Let's get into helping make this very good. And that would be an example of how a large company can deal with people, even at the household level, certainly at the developer level and the municipal level, to make this stuff physically real and physically better. The incentives are already there, right? You have to shift the market model and the investment model slightly. And players kind of want to help. If they knew, they don't really know very much, but they kind of want to help. The brain boxes want to help. And so the energy guys, we're waiting for you to join the party. <laughs> Sorry, we wanted to come at this one. The way he said one. <laughs> OK, the gentleman at the back, please. Okay, so I'm Orion Swane, I'm a professor at in Urban Planning and Environment at the Royal Institute of Technology. Um, I start with thinking about the planning is something people do with the idea that we can intentionally change things. It, things don't just happen, but people or society can influence the way things happen. Look at one and two up above your heads, of the, p of the heads of the panel there. Seems like we have a choice. The first question is like this, or the observation. Buildings last for 100 years. Um, democracy has been uh, an idea that has been around for 100 years. Cars last for 15 years. And the school system of Sweden is reformed every 15 years. You repaint your walls or you put new wallpaper every 15 to 20 years. And once you put your ICT dust on the wall, can you change it quickly enough for ICT development software or mm. our intentions to change with th or without repapering the walls? So that's Thank the you. first question. Uh -huh. Second observation is, this problem with pronouns, look, there it says we, it says our over there, and who is that? Who is that? It's such a tricky thing to hide an extremely complicated thing to just put two or three uh, letters on a piece of paper or, or on a presentation. Who can do something about this? I'll just leave it hanging in the air. <laughs> who wants to go first at that one? Rupe. Uh, first about the, it's a great observation that these material things are fundamentally different from digital things because you just don't download them from the net, they don't update them each, that way. And already kind of like, because energy is one of the first things where we've seen this happen, the, the big thing is that, okay, who will install the panels? Okay, so when we start having this type of exponential growth, it might be hit by, you know, that there needs to be a guy that goes and zzz, zzz, puts the panel there okay uh, and will they stay come and paint it as well this is why I say that when the bits and atoms join it doesn't mean that the intent that the world becomes internet it means that the physical world and the digital world will join and exchange qualities it's more like a kind of biological process than something that where, where cells change the, uh, some particles and so that's the right metaphor it rather than internet comes and disrupts the world really much like it has done for, uh, let's say, banking and uh, telecommunications and media and so forth. That's information. But when it comes to the physical world, it's, it's, some, it's, it's in, in a given place. There's wear and tear. You know, there's something cut out of this table. Matthias, you should get a new one. But you know, if you, if you want to get a new program, you just download it. So it's fundamentally different. It will, it will uh, be different internet after this thing has happened. Uh, for the second point, who is we? I think that's for us to decide. <laughs> and I've pretty much everyone except for Sarah as yet has wanted to comment on this. So let's just go like this. Yeah, no, but that's that's why the flower because I think we need to. Rec I mean, we we need to uh, bring that into consideration, like the the physical existing things, and that's not what we've done with society today. And uh, if we're going into a new era that where things are radically different from today, we cannot again go into it without thinking. We can't just leave it up to whatever technology progression to have. Or we can, but then you know we might just wipe out civilization. And so it's. I think we need to be really smart and strategic, and at least consider what we have to play with here. John. 
Yeah, but so early on, uh, quick answer, yes, everything can be upgraded and the amount of resources required is collapsing very fast. But actually the way to ask that question is, if you take cars and uh, housing, the physical requirements for those two aspects of your lifestyle, particularly the um, energy uh, minerals, heavy stuff, and, and toxics is so vastly greater than anything you could possibly need in lifetimes of Internet of Things that that's the question you should be asking. How do we improve auto culture and construction industry? They are the ones that are destroying the planet physically and chemically. It's not the tech. So tech can be upgraded, but also it's relatively innocent in the use cases that you're pointing to. Secondly, who is we? If we talk about planning very quickly, Planners are super unscientific and super undemocratic, and both of those will be very much helped by more data to process, to run a model which planners almost never do on how to design a city, and who to ask and how to ask them, which also they almost never do. So that's who we is. We is we for the first time, unlike the boffins and ivory tower that have been planning cities for a thousand years. <laughs> Thank you, sir. This guy keeps stealing my points. So. Okay, recap. But, uh, but, but no, actually, this uh, I do I do want to make a comment though on the on the we question and uh, talking about social contracts again because I think it, it does uh, serve uh, being emphasised a few times extra. Um, uh, technology is uh, developing quicker than our uh, social uh, uh, contracts today, and we can see that very clearly in terms of social media and uh, uh, ethics and uh, the the framework regulating behaviour uh, in this new te technology or that this new technology uh, uh, sort of uh, allows for, the interaction that it allows for, uh, it is lagging behind the technology. So I think this is something for the future, this is, a, this is going to be a continuing struggle going uh, forth, uh, maintaining the social contracts and renegotiating them uh, in, in an ever-increasing speed. Thank you. Before letting Rick get in, I just want to say that we are wrapping up in 10 minutes. And if you feel shy about asking a question in English, French, Danish, Spanish, and Swedish are also OK. So we've got two more questions. There. We've got room for, I think, a third or a fourth. We'll finish. That's true. Rick. Yeah, so um, I'll avoid talking about who we are. I have no idea. Uh, but the, um, your first question gave me a thought um, along the lines of connectivity. And that is... Uh, Instead of planning, uh, we could probably, uh, I think, making sure that things can connect. Uh, the smarts at the endpoints can develop um, while still sort of uh, uh, giving us something, uh, allowing the network and the result to sort of grow with us. Uh, so I, I would say connectivity is uh, a central issue to making an unplanned future work. Um, and as a side point uh, about smart cities and energy, smart grids, I'm sort of waiting for uh, the renewable uh, energy world to start talking about uh, having your solar panels or your um, lamps and stuff that use electricity to start uh, working two ways. Uh, so that everything that uses uh, electricity should be able to also transmit it. Uh, and they, uh, they shouldn't need a grid to be able to transmit electricity to something else. What you need is two things with the, that uses electricity and you connect them. So then you can sort of, a neighborhood can connect themselves uh, as well as to the national grid. Uh, then you sort of get away from having to build, rebuild the entire grid uh, as a way of integrating uh, the renewable energy, the small scale, the micro wind and micro solar solutions into our world. And that, I, I would say, will, will be uh, something that won't be planned, but it will uh, sort of, uh, could potentially evolve in a, in a, in a same way or, and help us. Thank you. James, now what is this? Well, I had a couple points I would want to react to specifically. One, I think the we is it the technology companies that are going to try to survive and uh, who have branded this smart cities uh, and Internet of Things. So it's Cisco, it's IBM, it's SAP, it's a lot of big players that are trying to survive because they think this is the next wave of, of technology and that'll keep them alive. Um, it may or may not. Um, there's a maker movement happening in the world. Uh, 120,000 people come together to, to make stuff. And it might be Arduino programming to create interactive, really smart, simple programming. But you can program basically physical environments. Uh, and kids are learning this in schools today. 
Um, so I think a combination of that and artists uh, will be leading the way. They always have, as far as showing people potential. Um, this thing used to be science fiction not too long ago. Um, it exists, so to your point, um, you know, the different movies have definitely influenced what we decide to create uh, once that had been, that's been put out there as a possibility in the, in the world. Um, and just to show the real-time uh, reality show, I got this clip from my friend uh, Dr. Spook, uh, DJ Spooky um, right before, uh, about 30 minutes ago. And again, he's showing, if we get sound, Okay, let's, let's, let's bring that beat back. Rewind. Rewind. If I find the controls somewhere. Okay. There. So my point is, I talked about transformation. Once people see things are possible, then they become that more likely to actually exist in the world. And if we've got media being shown There's a childlike wonder that I see in the work. These are kind of like Lego blocks by some mad scientist. <laughs> no, but I think you're right. It is, there has to be some naivete. You know, you do, we discovered there's something interesting in an 89 degree angle. We all have been beaten with a 90. That's the right angle, that's the correct angle. But what about what the 89 degree angle? It's just one degree off and just gives you slightly something Slightly different, and that uh, 360 of it anyway. A world renowned computer hacker claims to have breached the Cayman Islands registry of companies' website. One person can actually challenge big institutions that we can really performative thing. I got banned from PayPal, I also got banned from uh, Facebook, the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, and uh, Cayman <laughs> Islands. And <laughs> it's a long list. <laughs> so, this was a, a credit card that um, Paolo made. And, uh, but it's got all standard codes that works within the financial system. If you want to try a hacker bank, uh, it's, it's art, you know. <laughs> Yo, hey, what's hey. up? How you doing? Oh, good, good to see you. Good to see you. Let's hear, like, about the, the bridge product. My initial uh, idea was to create a mechanical device that would activate the wires. And then when I actually went to the top of the bridge, the vibration was so intense on the poles, you know, it was about a half inch going each way that I realized there's no need to act, have a mechanical system in place here for the wires that are, were attached to the bridge. I simply would attach them and let the flow of traffic and the flow of uh, commuters control the output, the, the sonic output. So it's like the city plays itself in a way. And this video was kind of like the anchor of my recent show and it was just kind of like playing with um, Baroque architecture and um, gaming technology. That's referenced in terms of like the video game element of him like going to battle another player. In this video also I'm playing with like not just voguing, which is a dance form I've been working with for a while, but um, breaking to kind of show how similar they, they are because they were both born in New York at the same time at the same place. Think about if you're dancing and you could make music just just the way you move. As an example. and subjects that are going to be presented in this show, I want to understand not just where they came from, but what they're doing now and where they're going to go. So this is the next thing. There's so much there. There's so much to do. I don't know. There's a lot going on, you know? 
future forward. I hope you can join us for hearing. So my point with this is if people can see a future, if they can imagine it, uh, it can happen. And we've also, we, I think we talk about experiments. Um, you talked about taxes. Like, what if we could do that in a safe space, in a laboratory? Whatever that looked like, a, a, a part of the town, if it's the basic income philosophy or something else, we need these experimental zones that can, we can learn from and incrementally improve. I think that's really, really important to the way that we develop this future um, with this Internet of Things and everything else. The one last thing I wanted to mention is um, the opportunity for you to co-create this future is um, October 11th and 12th. Uh, there's a group out of Berlin that uh, other cities are taking this on, a hackathon that's looking at Internet of Things, uh, distributed Internet of Energy. Um, so it's a hackathon that anyone can participate in in other cities uh, and create solutions uh, for your local area um, with the technologies that exist today. We are on our, on our way to wrap up, but we've got two quick questions. We're going to take them. Where are you? There you go. Ah, thank you. Uh, th and thanks for a very, very good seminar. I'm quite not sure if, I, if this makes me smarter or more confused. Uh, my name is Tres Lindberg. I'm a member of, of uh, the, the Swedish Parliament and, uh, and also on the Committee of uh, uh, Infrastructure and Communication. We are the one who's handling those issues. And uh, just... Um, to bring us back, not to the future, maybe to reality. Uh, this um, question about being conservative or progressive, I think it's, um, from a political view, it's uh, really more a um, generation issue. It's not, uh, you know, it depends on if you're an agent uh, MP or if you are on the quite younger <laughs> generation. <laughs> Uh, but but you don't need to be that young. But you know it's a mental thing. But still, it's, you can't just be progressive when it comes to to legislation because we still have to be a bit conservative because we have to actually avoid the problems. Um, and and I think the the topic for the future and from from the society level or all over is also you know avoiding the problems and supporting the challenges so i think we need to be a bit of both even though uh, i think most of us, of us in here really wants to be progressive or define us as progressive i love this as a final question and comment because that sort of sums up the beauty of uh, Fores and and demos helsinki teaming up i think that demos helsinki are really only very interested when it's 2030 and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> and we at Forest, we're most interested when we think it's relevant for parliamentarians right now. So when we team up, it becomes relevant in the distant future and relevant today. And that's going to be sort of my final question to you guys. Uh, okay, so what next? What should we do now? With all the things that we learned, what is the next step for parliamentarians like you, for think tanks like us, for all these different people that we see here, given the internet of no things? And James, you're first out, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got a short one, I think. Um, I want to work with both you guys, too, and I'm not sure if, if I'll do the, the real-time future or what that's going to be, but if you're doing, you know, 10 years out, you're doing 20 years out. Um, I like to be on that bleeding edge. That's where I'm comfortable um, exploring what's possible. So, you know, William Gibson said um, the future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Um, <clears throat> and that can be by place or that can be by mindset. You talked about the difference between the younger people and the older people. Um, and this is why I like experimentation as well because you don't have to go full force into this progressive agenda you can just do it in in one city or you can explore for a day in this hackathon it would be rad if you supported this hackathon in stockholm october 11th and the 12th to, to invite your citizens in to play with the future for a while um that hasn't been done before that show leadership from sweden um let's do that as a next step if you if you want all right. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll continue on what I said before. I'll uh, I'd like to see uh, I'd like to see you to sort of uh, uh, formulate a vision of uh, of a play or a situation where all everyone in Sweden can assume connectivity. So, in a place where we don't have to think about how to connect or what tools we use, it's just there, and then you build it. I don't know if I need this. Do I? Yep, thanks. 
Um, well, I would, uh, uh, from, a, from a planning uh, perspective, um, I would really like to highlight uh, the, uh, the potential for um, um, increased research in the planning field. You've mentioned this before. And so uh, we're living with a, with a huge uh, deficit of research in the planning field. And so this is an opportunity to, to do something about that. And so start de developing the, the, the uh, sort of social infrastructure uh, for, uh, um, for allowing this research to happen. I think that's the number one. So Paul Miller, who's DJ Spooky, he came to the Future Perfect Festival uh, on Vaxholm in 2012, and he is all about the future, but that's not progressive 100%. He's very smart about the need to balance carefully curating and understanding what we've got and what's good about it and how slow and fast to move. And so although he looks like he is the essence of the future and creative explosions, he's actually way way more nuanced than that than that assumption. So he plays the balance very carefully. What I would say right now is for everybody to check the baseline. One of the things that people I think get wrong is the idea that the future is either better or worse than what we've got. But you have to check what we've actually got first of all. And this is one of my challenges to rip in these guys. Look at where we're coming from. Our tables good, our books good, our pens good, are the legacy technologies that we think we're safe with because they're no longer new. Are they any good? The baseline might not be better than what we've, what's coming down the pike, it might be worse. And so check the baseline in institutions and in infrastructures and stuff. And for the government, since the government uh, released representative, I'm not sure if you're in the government, but a member of parliament asked the question, please, please hurry up and get proper structures and debates about these things. Because otherwise, the companies that James mentioned will take over and there won't be much choice. Governments are incredibly lazy and slow about responding to the opportunity space, but also the risks and the institutional flaws that we're going to get ourselves stuck in, privacy, whatever, if they don't grab the opportunity. So I would say play is one thing, commissions and legislation and investment is another, and let's see if the Nordics can keep leading for the next 50 years. Yeah, things, since things are changing so rapidly now, make sure that you have access to the information you need when making your decisions. So since you're every six minutes on Facebook, you, it's probably good to start to follow some people there. So you don't just see cheese sandwiches and babies, but some get some inf interesting information uh, through that channel, where, which you anyway are at. Uh, and then secondly, or read The Economist or Wired or, or whatever you want, but take like you need to be observant now because things are happening fast. Secondly, go out into nature, hike for a weekend, sit around a bonfire. I mean, that's really, you know, just do it and it may gives you the perspective you need. I think I have two points as well. The other one would be that I really disagree. Maybe the first time I disagree with Matthias, it, 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 it's, um, we at Demos Health think we're super interested in today. We just think to understand what's really in the scale. You have to look into the future. You have to ask yourself that why on earth is Airbnb worth so much? Why on earth is Uber worth so much? I mean, these are things that are happening today. And I'm not a forecaster. I'm just a futurist. So I don't know the future. I just speculate around it. Uh, but th it's key to understand that most of the natural resources are tied into energy, housing or other kind of structures transportation and food. So these are the fields that are going to, going to be disrupted somehow. It can be your Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, etc. that does it, or we do it in a Nordic way. I mean, it it's really is up to us, and it's not five years. I mean, Uber is on the streets now, Airbnb is on the streets now, Google it'll, will somehow get to the Swedish energy market. And, and then we can probably be happy that it's not Wattenfall, but it's someone else, but still, it's Google. Do you like that, or would you like to own it yourself? It's very, very topical. It's happening today. And, and to understand that, yeah, this is, this is uh, you have to look into the future to understand what will become part of this new digital sphere with this exponential growth and be able to find a Nordic way of doing that. Because otherwise, the Yanks will do that. James, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Rupert. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> Thank I, you for I, it's the last time, I promise. Yeah, can we get a, uh, a celebration of who's in the room? Let's do it for the, for the world to see this cool gathering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just almost forgot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Uppe, for taking this initiative. And I think if we compare the few of us who were doing the same thing, or what I thought would be the same thing when we did it in Almedalen, I think we've 
progressed tremendously since since then, just by discussing it a second time. And I think if we continue to progress in that pace, I think we'll all be the world leaders in, in, in thinking about Internet of No Things. I know some of you have been at Forest many times, so some of you already have the Forest gift certificate. It's trees that we plant where they need it the most, in, in uh, eastern Kenya, where they provide water and shade and nutrition and help keep uh, climate emissions down. Um, until now, you still have to go into the internet and log into the coordinates. You can see what they are, but very soon we're going to try and make sure that they can just communicate directly but with you and tell if they've got enough water and how they're doing. So please accept this, uh, this Thank you. gift certificate of, uh, please pass it forward, uh, certificate of trees in Kenya. Now we're at the liberal think tank which means that you are free to consume liberal quantities of wine, should you wish to do so. At liberal pricing, which means that you can pay nothing or as much as you like, we have an upper ceiling. You can't pay more than 10,000 crores because then we get somehow dependent on you. But um, I want to thank the whole panel, especially Rupi, but all of you, for this wonderful discussion. And I would love for you to stick around because these are people that you really would want to discuss things with over a glass of two of wine or water. Thank you ever so much, all of you. Thank you.